As some of you might have noticed in my most recent videos, I am no longer a Tin Man. This means that I have beaten every boss in Old School RuneScape. This also means that I am qualified to tell you which is the hardest. In today's video, I'm going to be going through Jagex's official Old School RuneScape bossing ladder. What even is a bossing ladder? The whole ladder concept stems from completing easier content, which will give you the skills to climb to more difficult content. In this video, we're not going to be talking about Slayer Superiors, we're not going to be talking about skilling bosses, and we're not going to be talking about quest bosses. I kind of hate the early, mid, and end game descriptions. They're meaningless, but they do drive a lot of engagement from you guys in the comments. Anyways, I did want to break these into tiers because especially at these early levels, like honestly, these bosses aren't really all too much more difficult than each other. Welcome to tier 1 art, entry level dub, baby's first boss tier. Don't worry, you will soon become a man. A man who swings medieval farming equipment. Our first boss is actually going to be the newest boss in the game, and that is going to be Scurrius the Rat King. Scurrius is actually meant to be farmed for XP, there's not really any drops or loot to note other than the pet and the spines which help you far more experience here. The boss does have more going on for it mechanically than most of the other bosses in this tier, but all these mechanics are not very punishing, which is ideal for newer players to learn. Barrows was actually my first boss experience ever. It was on release day, and I remember we would use a method where one player would click on the ground and it would block a Barrows brother, long since patched, don't even try it, and the other person would just fire strike it to death. I never got anything from the chest, but players with much more money than me would often die to Darok, and we would just take all their shit. This is a decent early game moneymaker, and I find it really enjoyable due to the variety of loot that you get here, and that you get it pretty often, so this is much more exciting than a lot of the other methods in this tier. The Mola is a perfect example of a boss that was designed for early game players in mind, but is exclusively farmed by endgame pet hunters. Killing the Mola is about 2 mil per hour if you have a Twisted Bow. If you don't have a Twisted Bow, this is going to be substantially worse. I would not recommend fighting this without Fally Hard for the Mole Locator, and you need at least an Osmumpton's Fang to make this worthwhile. At the end of the day, the Mole isn't so much about making money, it's more about getting the E-Girl pet. Next up, we got the Wilderness Demi Bosses and the Swamp Man. I'm talking about these three dudes. Honestly, these aren't really worth touching outside of a few combat achievements and a few collection log slots. If you're an early game Iron Man, you can get your Rune Crossbow from the Archaeologist, but these are honestly going to be a skip for most people. KBD is another boss that I am super nostalgic about. The loot really isn't anything to write home about, but personally, I really like the KBD pet. The best way to farm the KBD is to invite a ton of lower level people to the boss, tell them that you're not going to pick up any of the loot and they can take all of it and just let them tank for you. It's basically a free boosting service. Obor and Bryophyta are both super simple as they're meant to be farmed by free to play players. For a normal player, these aren't going to be worth you farming out outside of the combat achievements, just the time that it takes to get a key in order to go in and fight them, the loot's just really not going to be worth it. They're more meant to just be an extra reward for free-to-play players who are training on Moss or Hill Giants. Hesporia is a farming boss that I recommend all new players get into as soon as humanly possible. It's great experience, it has a really good chance of giving you the pet, and the rewards are pretty good as well. There's a bunch of combat achievements here, and Iron Men must do this to get their compost bucket. Tier 2 is a slight increase in difficulty over Tier 1. You could technically die to these bosses, but you probably won't. Just like the mole, Serechnus was designed with mid-game players in mind, but is exclusively farmed by pet hunters. I could also see some Iron Men doing this if you're tired of killing Spideens and you do need red spider's eggs. Scorpia actually just got buffed. I'm not really sure if she's worth killing or not. It's better than it was, but I think it's mostly still just a pet hunt. Mechanically, there's not a whole lot to Scorpia. You just attack her with a powered staff, freeze the offspring, lure her a little bit away from the offspring, and finish her off. The biggest threat here is PKs. You're in deep wilderness and you're in multi, just don't risk a lot. I go up there in monk robes and I kill it just fine. Bro, Chaos Elemental, I hate this boss. Everything about this boss is just made to be as annoying as humanly possible. He teleports you around, he takes off your gear, and he just does an unnecessary amount of unavoidable damage in the deepest part of multi-wilderness. Just like the other wilderness bosses, they did buff this drop table, but ultimately, I would only kill this if you're going for the pet. Callisto, Vedinatus, and Vedion got many solo versions of themselves added a while back, they're basically a low risk version of the big boys, but with three drops. I do strongly recommend these. I just did a bunch of them for some B-roll for this video, and it was super fun. I think they're a great way for early game players to learn the mechanics needed in order to do the bigger boss variants. It's literally the same boss fight, just everything is way less punishing and it has way less health. If you are worried about getting PK, just realize these aren't in that deep of wilderness. You can teleport out with a glory or a seed pod. 
And you are in single, so you just have to tank one person at a time. Gotizo is the easiest pet to get in the game, and he also gives you a guaranteed hard clue scroll and a very good chance of getting an elite with it. In order to fight Scotizo, you need to get totems from doing Slayer in the Catacombs of Current. As far as the mechanics goes, he's super simple. Just pray mage if you're far away from him, pray melee up close, and then you are going to need Arclight so you can one-hit the totems that spawn to protect him. This boss isn't going to teach you anything, but it is a nice little reward from training the Slayer skill. Does the Mimic really even count as a boss? I'm not really sure. He's not much of a threat, but he does give you a really good chance of third edge. The Kraken is likely the first Slayer boss that you're going to fight. The fight is super simple. Throw your fishing explosive into the middle whirlpool, and then just shoot it with your trident. The drops are pretty decent here. You're going to make like 1 to 2 mil an hour, and it's super AFK. Boys, it finally happened. Today's video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. I'll be honest with you, I've been meaning to try Raid for a long time now after seeing so many of the ads, and I am actually enjoying it way more than I thought I was going to. This is a perfect game for morning commutes, waiting rooms, or if you're taking an extended bathroom break at work. The game is available on Android, iOS, and even on PC, as you can see I have up now. You can download and try the game for free using my link down in the description below, or by scanning the QR code on screen. Raid is a very robust game with a narrative story storyline and so much depth that you can literally play it for years on end without getting bored. With over 800 heroes, PvE, PvP, CVC, so many artifacts, clan bosses, there is always something to do. It really is a world that you can easily immerse yourself in. With all of this exciting stuff and more coming to Raid, Raid is celebrating its fifth anniversary and honestly they went a little bit nuts with all the free stuff for new players. Don't forget to use my link down in the description or the QR code on screen to receive bonuses worth up to $100 that includes amazing goodies and new epic champion Tyrell. You can start by summoning champions right away but when you reach level 25 you'll have even more freebies in store for you. Once you start crushing your opponents come find me in game under the name Patty Fatty Cake. You can join my clan and we'll be legends together. Dagonoth Kings are usually fought really early on in your progression, but they have way more going on during them for them to be in the last tier. This is going to be the first boss on our list where you do have to tri -brid and use all attack styles and change all your prayers, which adds a couple layers of intensity to this. Additionally, there is a bit of a DPS check because you have to keep them all in cycle, otherwise you can end up with multiple DKs attacking you at once. Killing the Dagonoth Kings is actually pretty decent money coming in over 2 mil an hour. I would only recommend these if you have a Slayer task and if you have Fremenic Elite, you're not going to make anywhere near that much money unless you have the noted Dagonoth bones. All right, time to put those shaky hands to work. Getting your fire cape is a rite of passage, and the fight caves are the first really big challenge that every player has to face. You have to face wave after wave of enemies that attack you in different ways with the different textiles. The enemy's attacks aren't very punishing, which gives this activity a very low skill floor. That being said, the complexity of the different enemies, positioning, pathing, planning, give it an extremely high skill ceiling. Honestly, the hardest thing for new players here is the nerves. Switching your prayers every five seconds is not difficult for anyone, uh, but the pressure of the whole hour cave that you've already done, just culminating into this one moment where one mistake can end it, can really get to people. The Kelphi Queen, like the KBD and Chaos Elemental, are the oldest bosses in RuneScape. Way back in the day when I was a wee lad, KQ was like the endgame final boss of RuneScape. Back then, Jagex had one mechanic, and that was shitload of unavoidable damage. I put this one in the mid-game tier because it's not really mechanically difficult, it just does a shitload of damage to you, and you do need a lot of DPS to out-damage her and get consistent multi-kill trips. Loot isn't terrible, but it's really nothing to write home about, but she does drop one of my favorite pets in the game. Next, I'm going to be rattling through a bunch of Slayer bosses since I think they pretty much all belong in this tier. I know they do have some high Slayer level requirements, but mechanically, they're really not all too difficult. The Thermonuclear Smoke Devil has a high requirement at 93 Slayer in order to fight him. Overall, if you do want to just face tank him, you can kill him very easily. Literally just hit boss, heal up when your health gets low, there's nothing really more to it. There are a few ways you can mitigate damage from the boss. One is by freezing the boss and then getting outside of his attack range and attacking him from far away. And the other is using a red X step under mechanic in order to stall the boss to make sure that you hit him once for every time he hits you. Overall, loot. Once once again, not terrible, not great, you're pretty much only here for the pets. Cerberus is a three-headed hellhound that can be killed on hellhound tests with 91 Slayer. He is currently the best moneymaker on our list. You do have to have quick reaction time to avoid the lava pools and to manage your prayers during the ghost phase. 
Mechanically, this one is not as difficult as some of the other ones that I'm also putting in this tier, but the mistakes here are extremely punishing. The Grotesque Guardians are the Gargoyle boss, and although you can fight them earlier than most of the other Slayer bosses, you likely aren't going to. Honestly, the loot here is terrible. You would only be killing these for the collection log slots, the pets, or the combat achievements. I know like a million other people have already mentioned this, but it would be great if they could make the dust that you get from here tradable, which would add some profit to the loot table and actually make these worth killing. These are going to be a little bit more mechanically challenging than some of the others. There is a melee phase and a range phase, which will require you to change both your prayer and your gear. And you do have to have a little bit of timing and precise positioning to avoid taking damage in the in-between phases. This boss is going to help you prepare for other bosses that do require prayer and gear swaps. Nah, the Sire. Another Slayer boss. I have these blocked, so I'm not really going to be doing it. I, I just don't really enjoy the Sire too much. There's a lot going on, and the reason that I don't like the Sire is this part that this guy's doing right here is these respiratory systems. You do have to kill those before you're able to kill the boss, and it just it adds like an extra minute of prep to every single kill, which just makes farming this boss really long and annoying. Other than that, it's pretty much just a melee-only boss that so you have to move away every once in a while. Little side note, shout out to all the unpaid actors who I feature in this. Um, th there's some bosses that I don't want to go and grind a Slayer task for, so... I do really appreciate you. Yo, Chemical Hydra is currently the highest level Slayer boss in the game. And oh boy, can I tell you, I am glad to stop talking about Slayer bosses. Killing the Hydra does make you absolute bank, coming in at 4.2 mil an hour, but he's going to make you work for it. It is a little bit more difficult than any of the other Slayer bosses that we've seen so far. You're going to have to keep track of his attacks as he does change attack styles every three attacks, and you do have to lure him around the room onto the different vents that you see on my screen here all while dealing with the different special attacks of each one of his phases. Once you get towards the end of the fight, mistakes are extremely punishing, and if you do miss a few prayers in a row, you are going to get stacked out. Well, normally I would say that this would kind of prepare you for other encounters where you do have to count the attacks, like the Corrupted Gauntlet and stuff like that, uh, but if you are 95 sight, so you're probably already doing that stuff. Anyways, uh, this is kind of just more of an endgame moneymaker. Next up, we have the God Wars dungeon. Back in the day when I was first starting, the way that you would do this is you'd go up there with a bunch of your friends, and one person would tank, the rest of everybody would just like whack away at the boss, but those days are long behind us. Nowadays, God Wars dungeon is more commonly done as a solo encounter. You still can do this the classic method, the GP per hour is just really bad compared to just a rune crossbow. For all of these methods, basically what you're looking to do is kite the boss around the room, hit them while they cannot hit you. Bandos can utilize several different kiting methods depending on your weapon. The mechanical difficulty here comes mostly from attacking on the right tile at the right time relative to where he is and understanding true tiles. You need to be able to recover from mistakes as getting hit from a melee can be very punishing. Zamorak has a very similar method to Bandos, often using a red X and using flinch mechanics to run through him without being hit. I find this one to be a little bit more punishing than Bando's. Uh, you get hit higher and the GP per hour is significantly worse. I really only recommend Zami if you're interested in the pet and you have a Slayer task. Sardaman is the same concept, just run around the room and hit the boss when your tile lines up with the tile that you're supposed to be hitting from. There's actually some tiles you can import into here that make it so you don't really have to have a stamina. I'll try to link that down in the description. Uh, let me know if I forget. But yeah, with those, you can pretty much stay here forever as long as you get enough prayer potions, super restores, or whichever one that they drop here. Which is probably the most difficult out of the bosses just because you do have to know where to run, where to walk manually, and her attacks hit bigfully. I know we already talked about them, but next up we do have the wilderness bosses. We got Vedion, Callisto, and Venonatus. These are the big boy versions, the multi-combat versions of the little ones that we talked about earlier. I'm not gonna go over the mechanics because they're literally identical. They just do more damage to you if you mess up and they have more hit points. These are in multi-combat, so you can do it with friends, but also that does mean that PKers can kill you with friends, which is the biggest hazard here. You can just get continuously logged in on by massive teams if you go at the wrong times. It's really just a dice roll at that point. Overall, these are pretty good money, uh, some of the best money makers in the game right now outside of raids, so I do recommend it, and it can be fun to do with friends. Oh, you thought I forgot about Armadil. No, I'm too busy wiping the Colosseum to gear up for it right now. Okay, here we are. We're going to Armadil. I peeled myself away from the Colosseum for a couple minutes to film this for you. Uh, Armadil ranges you, so you can't kite Armadil around. You just get hit. Uh, honestly, Armadil, my least favorite of these. It doesn't take a whole lot of skill. Basically, you either face tank him and just DPS him down, 
or you can use Chinchampas to bounce damage off of his melee minion. Mechanics wise, I think Armadillo is the easiest one to solo. You do just take more damage, so your kills are going to be limited based off of basically what food you can pick up, how much damage you can mitigate through your gear. If you do not have a ZCB, Shadow, or Twisted Bow, I strongly recommend using Chinchampas, and I do not recommend doing Armadillo at all unless you have a Slayer task. When I ask you about like a mid-game boss, the first thing that comes to most people's mind is going to be Vorkath. You, you just cannot get more middle of the road than this. Uh, it's middle of the road money, middle of the road skills and mechanics and everything. You're going to be able to get away with mostly just face tanking Vorkath, stabbing him with your lance, and occasionally moving from side to side. There are two special attacks that you do have to deal with. The first one, you cast a spell at this little uh, face hugger thing from the movie Alien. And the second special is a little bit more tricky. You're going to be wooks walking this because you are not a coward. All you got to do is click the boss and then click away from the boss and just repeat that sequence until she's done spitting out acid. Tier 4, I don't know what to call this. Anyways, these are going to be the bosses that are going to be preparing you to take on the endgame content like Zuck. The Corporeal Beast is really just like a thousand pound chicken. The meta for killing Corp involves specking him down, so basically all of his stats are zero, he does no damage to you, and you just slice through him like a hot knife through butter. The worst part about this is that it does take like five to ten minutes of setup, just teleporting to your house over and over and over again, and... Just anybody can hop in and take your kill that you've just specced down for 10 minutes. Well, it took me three kills to get this footage because I got crashed literally just how I just said twice while trying to film this. Super annoying when you're trying to get a video out. Anyways, I do recommend doing corp, but do it with some friends. Don't do it solo unless you're an Iron Man. Next up, we do have the Nightmare of Ashihama. It's the Weenie Hut Jr. version of the Fasani's Nightmare, which is what you should actually be doing. The drops here are incredibly rare, and just realize that you do have to multiply this out by the amount of people that are currently killing it, because only one of you can get it. You literally need stamina potions in order to run here, because the run is that long. I think it's a combination of these two things that make this ball not very popular, but this list that I'm making here is not a popularity contest. This boss is mechanically challenging in its own right. Nightmare is a high level. She can attack with all attack styles and comes with a bunch of different special attacks that you do have to pay attention to. With the normal Nightmare, each one of her phases does have a set special attack, so you can be prepared for each one. If you're interested in trying this content out, I recommend doing a few kills on the Mass World, and then once you do feel comfortable with all of the mechanics, move on to the Fasani's Nightmare. Zora, the Money Snake. Well, no longer really makes you any money, but this boss is very challenging and is going to make you a much better player in the long run. Zora has three phases and all of them have their own unique attack styles. You must switch your gear and prayer during the fight, all while changing positioning to make sure that you aren't sitting in venom clouds and so that you can avoid Zora's melee attacks. Zora is a really good introduction to the fast paced gameplay that didn't really exist in the game before Zora, but now is the standard for most endgame content that is being released. The Grumbler has a really similar vibe to both Zora and Vorkath. It's a quick, repeatable encounter that's not really committal, but it does shit out money. The boss has two different phases that you attack with either range or mage. Being able to count ticks is going to help the player move to avoid the melee attack, or you can just freeze them. Positioning and pathing is going to become very important to avoid the spikes that he spawns, and reaction time and prayer switching will be important to avoid getting hit by the mage attacks as well. Next is going to be our last God Wars dungeon boss, and also the last monster in this tier, and she is not like the others. The first thing that you're going to want to do for next is come to the GE and buy a thousand of these guys. Next does constant unavoidable damage, which makes you need to chug a lot of those brews, and necessitates killing her as fast as humanly possible. A lot of you might be thinking that next should be later on in this video, and if you're looking at just like a gear and skill requirement, you are correct, but mechanically there's really not a whole lot going on here. Stay within melee range when you're supposed to, and then yeet off to far distance when you're supposed to. Hit the boss and chug a lot of brews. Currently next is the best moneymaker in the game. The drops have held their value extraordinarily well. I think this is mainly because nobody wants to do this boss, and the drops are very useful. For tier 5, we're going to be focusing on these bosses that are right at the very end of the mid game, at the very beginning of the end game. And I'm talking about the Desert Treasure 2 bosses. Duke Succulus is by far the easiest of the four, but he is my favorite of the four. I mean, just, just look at this guy. And he does drop one of the best pets in the game. Fight itself has this super annoying potion making or mushroom spamming thing that you have to do in order to wake him up. Then you have to dodge his attacks using time step X positioning and hiding behind the pillars. 
I do really like this boss, but the setup phase at the beginning should be shortened or allow us to like stack up supplies to quickly make more potions. Whisper is the next most difficult on our list. There are three different special attacks to learn and master. You have to prayer switch while moving to avoid the tentacles, and the final enrage phase can throw a lot of newer players for a loop. The one major downside of this boss is that the enrage phase is a DPS check. If you don't do enough damage because your gear isn't good enough, you will just fail the kill due to sanity. The Leviathan is a massive sea snake, and it really reminds me of Subnautica, which I'm playing currently when I'm not scaping. This boss really should be the hardest of the four. His attacks are randomized and increase in speed as the fight goes on, and you have to move to avoid his rock attacks. But all of this can just be completely ignored using the Smoke Barrage spell. If you just treat regular Leviathan like the Awakened version, it becomes a simple yet satisfying cycle of dealing with both of his special attacks until you're ready to proc Enrage. And on the regular Leviathan, during the Enrage, two Webweaver specs are usually enough to finish the boss. Bardorfus is going to cap up our top end of the Desert Treasure 2 bosses. His attacks are extremely punishing, and if mistakes are made, there can be a lot going on at the same time. Dodging Axis is going to be your number one priority, so you always have to keep an eye out for them and make sure that your positioning is correct in order to dodge these and also to avoid his spike attack. Make sure to watch out for his head, which shoots out a ranged projectile. If this hits you, your prayer will be deactivated and you will take an unprotected melee attack. The reason I think that this one is the hardest is that it is just the most fast paced. There's so much of the stuff that's all going on simultaneously and it can become quite overwhelming. First up, we got Tombs of a Masket. This is Baby's first raid. This raid's invocation scaling allows for you to start off really slow and then ramp this raid up to a very difficult experience. Best part about this is that your loot does scale up as the raid gets more difficult. Being a 30 minute experience with five different bosses, some with multiple phases, adds a large amount of complexity that we just haven't seen in earlier bosses in this video. Not only do you have to learn difficult mechanics for one boss, you have to do it for all five and arguably seven if you count each one of Warden's three phases. If you have combats in the mid 80s, low 90s or so, this is going to be the single best way for you to advance your account, uh, not only in wealth because the drops are often and pretty valuable, but also in the skills required to complete other content that you're going to see later in this video. Now, here we are at the Chambers of Zarek, RuneScape's very first raid, and honestly, Jagex knocked it out of the park with this one. In a similar vein to the Chambers of Amasket, this raid requires you to learn a ton of different mechanics for all of the different rooms and different bosses. You can't wipe though, so you can really brute force this raid when you are learning it. For this reason, the skill floor of Cox is really low, so it allows pretty much everybody to get in and give it a try. However, the skill ceiling on this one ramps up greatly and allows for a ton of optimizations to speed up raids and offer a better purple chance. Challenge Mode Chambers of Zarek takes this even further and requires you to complete every single room that you can normally get in the raid. CMs require you to have an in-depth knowledge of every single room in the raid and be pretty good at them. All of the boss's stats are jacked up and do a ton of damage to you, which requires you to kill them quickly and efficiently. Not only this, but the whole raid does have a timer on it, so these are not for learning how to do the raid. If you do complete the raid on time, you will be greatly rewarded. These raids, while difficult, are an absolute purple factory, and you might even see a twisted ancestral kit. A little bit of a trigger warning for the Iron Men out there, because we're at the Corrupted Gauntlet. And despite often being referred to as mid-game content, because you can access it pretty early on in your account progression, it is one of the most mechanically challenging encounters in the game. Before you even get to the Hunlith, you have seven and a half minutes to prep your inventory. This is a skill in and of itself, and if you are having trouble prepping, my biggest advice is to always be doing something. This might sound stupid, but when I watch people who are learning this, they waste a ton of time just standing and thinking about what to do next. The boss itself starts off really slow, but ramps up to an extremely challenging and rage phase. You have to change attack styles, prayers, avoid tornadoes that follow you, and remember, the floor is lava. If you think this looks simple, be my guest, give it a shot, and maybe you'll spoon a 1kc enhanced that you can flex on all the dry iron men here in the 474 lobby. The Theater of Blood is the most difficult of the standard raids, and is in my opinion, the best raid. If I had to narrow down why I love this raid so much, is there's no bullshit prep phase, there's no puzzle rooms, it's literally just hit boss. There are a total of six bosses, all with extremely punishing mechanics that have to be learned and executed by a team. This means that not only do you have to play well, but your teammates have to play well as well. Out of all the rooms, Bloat is the most challenging. A lot of people who do a lot of top will tell you that Bloat is the final boss of RuneScape, but I would like to challenge that. Uh, I'd argue that your teammates during Bloat are the final boss. At the end of the theater, you will face Verzik Batur. She has three extremely challenging phases, which will wipe most beginner teams. 
Oh, and did I mention that if your whole team dies, you do have to start over? This little bit of risk is something that makes the theater beautiful, but can be very frustrating for learners. The Pisani's Nightmare is the man's version of the nightmare that we saw in the prior section. It's almost the same fight, but everything is tuned through the roof. Oh, and it still takes a literal eon to run back here every time you die. You can use all of the special attacks from the normal nightmare in every phase to always keep you on your toes, and she does her black spot floor special every time she's doing a different special attack, so you have to constantly move while changing prayers and dealing with the regular special attacks. In the final phase, she deactivates your prayer with every attack, and in Enrage, you'll have a timer to kill her before the sleepwalkers end up killing you. While this is already much more difficult than the regular nightmare, mistakes here are also much more punishing, with the max hit being an 80 for making a mistake, making it very difficult to recover if you do make a mistake. Unfortunately, this boss, while being one of the sickest fights in the game, also suffers from the nightmare's god-awful drop table, so not a lot of people really do this. Tier 7, the sweatiest of the sweatiest. Uh, if you do any of this content, you should really look into going outside, but we all know you won't. The Awakened Whisper is the easiest of the four Awakened Desert Treasure 2 bosses, and like all of the other Awakened bosses, the Whisper requires an Awakener's Orb to enter each fight. If you're a slow learner like me, this could get very costly very quickly. This is the fast-paced fight, and the best way I can describe it is that it's the normal Whisper, only more so. Instead of three, there are five standard auto attacks, more tentacles, more ghost spawns, and my least favorite part, more pillars. As a man who can only count to four, the hardest part of this entire fight for me is being able to memorize the five pillars. Almost all of my wipes were because of this. If you're mechanically sound and you have a good short-term memory, this one will be a lot easier for you than it was for me. Next up, we got Duke Succulus, and this one is wildly different from the normal version. The annoying prep phase at the start has you make three potions this time because our boy is very big now. The fight starts off basically the same, just with more damage. After a while, he will start shooting out four gas balls that makes it so you have to strategically place them in other vents throughout the room. After this, he will coat you in acid which forces you to maintain a cycle of attacking while walking off the acid. Towards the end of the fight, a black ball will pace back and forth in the arena doing damage to you. Other folks seem to make this one look really easy, but I personally had a ton of trouble with it. We have the Inferno, which is a massive rite of passage, it's the natural successor of the fight caves. There is no better feeling in this game than getting your first Infernal Cave. While the Inferno is no longer the hardest content in the game, it sets itself apart by being a marathon instead of a sprint. For your first cape, this is likely going to be some grueling two-hour experience after doing extensive research into advanced blob and bat mechanics, only to plank on triple jeds because your hands got a little bit too shaky. Because of the super long time for completions, this can be a miserable experience for a ton of first-timers. My best advice, if you are really struggling, with this is take a break and go do something else, come back in a couple days and you're likely going to be refreshed and perform quite a bit better. I firmly do believe that pretty much everybody is capable of getting their Infernal Cape, it's just going to take some a lot more time than others and comparison is the thief of all joy so stop comparing yourself to some Giga Chad gamer. Hardmo Top is the theater of blood on steroids, it's overtuned to the moon and is the hardest raid in the game. All of the bosses are substantially beefier and get extra mechanics, Maiden has permanent tomatoes and permanent blood, Crabs heal her extra and increase her attack speed till she's blowpiping you. Bloat has hands and feet falling at all times, even when you're attacking him. This might not seem like much, but honestly, I think this is the hardest part of the raid. More than 95% of my hard mode top wipes are on Bloat. He is absolutely obnoxious. Nilo spawned three demi bosses in the middle of it, and pillars do have less health. There's also a few additional mechanics during the boss. Sodotsug shoots out extra balls, and the maze is split into three sections. Honestly, great job by Jagex on this one. It's a really cool mechanic. Zarpus is easier in every way. The room is smaller, so you can get to the exhumes quicker. They heal his shield less. Melee distance is perfectly outlined for you, and you can legitimately AFK this last part. Verzik, on the other hand, is an absolute menace. In the first phase, you must run pillar to pillar to avoid the rubble in P2 as it is left behind every time a cabbage lands, and P3 is absolutely nuts. She swaps tank every special attack. Crabs are permanent unless they are popped or shot. The yellow balls have three spots you have to do in a row. The green ball must be bounced or it will automatically kill the person it is on. And tornadoes heal her three times what they hit you for. Once she reaches 5% health, she will gain back 30% of her health, which is a nightmare to deal with as tornadoes are chasing you the entire time. Okay, when I started this video off, I did have everything completed, but 
The Coliseum has come out and I am still a quiverless noob and it's driving me a little bit nuts. The Coliseum is basically Inferno 2 Electric Boogaloo. It's more difficult, more punishing, and the solves are significantly more difficult. On top of this, every wave you have to pick another way to nerf yourself. The super fun part about this is that there are some invocations that are straight up run enders. If you get a pick with Doom, Doom Scorp, and Totemic, sorry bud, the run is over. The boss himself, Soul Heritage, is extremely challenging fast pace, and has a ton of different mechanics to deal with on top of the shakiest hands known to man. I've heard a lot of people say that this is easier than the Inferno because it's faster, but I want to argue that for the average shitter like myself, your time to get to the end boss is actually longer in the Colosseum because one, it's significantly harder to get to the boss, so you're going to die more often doing that, but also you just have to reset a certain amount of times because the invocations are unplayable. Wish me and my shaky hands luck, boys. I'm going to have this thing by this weekend, I promise. The Awaken Leviathan is my personal favorite of the Awakened fights, and in my opinion, is the second hardest monster in old school RuneScape. I do understand that a lot of other people would rank him number one, different strokes for different folks. I will explain and justify my reasoning in just a second. The fight itself is done by using the Shadow Barrage mechanic to actually skip all of his normal auto attacks, so this way you just have to deal with his two special attacks that are very easy to do. The cycle for this is super satisfying just because it flows so nicely. The hard part of the fight though comes down to the Enrage phase, which is hands down the most difficult thing in the game. You have to prayer switch for a different attack every single tick while moving attacking and avoiding boulders that spawn, you can easily get sucked into melee range with bad pathing and honestly it's the most insane thing to try to deal with. That being said, you only have to deal with it for 20 seconds, 2 web weavers, 5-7 to seven Tebow hits are all that you need, and you can get extremely lucky on the prayer switches and get several of the same style in a row. To be perfectly honest with you guys, I got super spooned on my prayer switches when I got my kill. I'm not pretending to be some insane god guru gamer here. I'm reasonably competent, but I just got really lucky. Awakened Vardorvis is literally invincible. The first time that I got to his enrage phase, I literally died laughing just because of how impossible it was. First things first, the axes. These things, they hit you 96 off prayer. Avoiding them is your first priority. Vard himself hits 50s if your prayer drops. There are mage and range orbs that turn off these prayers. After a certain percentage, they will spawn at the same time back to back. This requires you to move and prayer switch on the same tick, all while planning ahead for the next move. Once you reach the enrage phase, these orbs spawn constantly back to back, so there is no breathing room. You are constantly changing your prayers, moving, hitting over and over again. It is extremely difficult. While this is slightly less nutty to deal with than the Leviathan's enrage phase, Bard's difficult phases last about two minutes of the kill instead of the 20 seconds, which is why I personally think that Vard is the hardest. Thank you guys so much for watching. This took forever to put together. If you did enjoy the video, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and a massive thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to download Raid Shadow Legends, link down in the description, and a QR code here on screen.